Okay, everyone, it is two o'clock. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to our author webinar on esports and higher education. My name is Patty Webb, and I'm the marketing manager for Stylus Publishing. Uh, Stylus webinars bring you direct access to our latest titles and direct access to our authors. Today's webinar is a little different uh, as we are in Zoom meeting format. Um, so you can interact with your authors and share throughout the event. This meeting will be recorded and reposted on YouTube. So if you'd like to turn off your video camera, you may do so. We also encourage you to use the chat, raise hand and Q&A functions as well. Usual Zoom etiquette applies. So please keep your mics on mute if you're not speaking or asking a question. Today, I'm happy to introduce George McClellan, Ryan Arnett and Charles Huber, the authors of eSports and Higher Education, Fostering Successful Student Athletes and Successful Programs. The book is a comprehensive resource that examines the rapidly growing esports phenomenon in higher education, bringing the perspectives of players, administrators, and scholars together in one volume to discuss the basics of esports and how to start and maintain successful esports programs, as well as examines the issues and trends in the field. So without further ado, welcome to George, Ryan, and Charles. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a brief minute, and I'm George. Uh, we'll take a brief minute and get started with, uh, uh, it's, it's a size group where we can actually invite everybody uh, to unmute and perhaps introduce themselves and talk about their connection to eSports. So if somebody wants to unmute and just sort of share, what brings you here today? Well, I'll, I'll start. I'm David Brightman, and I, I was your editor for this book at Stylus. And uh, so that's my connection, and I'm excited uh, about this webinar. Thanks, everybody. I can go next. Uh, I'm Jimmy Palmer. I am the eSports coordinator for the University of Mississippi. And um, I've got a copy of George's book and uh, wanted to uh, hear what would be said today. Thanks. Welcome, Jimmy. Hi, I'm Kim Jackson, Director of Student Programs at Big Bend Community College in Moses Lake, Washington. And we don't have an esports program yet, and I've been doing a lot of research on it. And so I just, again, this is another step for me to get more research. Great, welcome. Anybody I else? Am, I okay. am Juliet Kern from Bates Technical College. I am a Assistant Director for Campus Life. And similar to Kim, I am researching what it takes to put together an esports team and building that um, for our campus. Wonderful, welcome. Who else would like to go? Anybody else want to share? Sure, hi, um, my name is Caitlin Griffith. I'm the interim director of student life at James Madison University. Um, and we are very much like the past two, looking to kind of develop the esports program here. We have two student organizations that are independent um, and starting to work with them and just starting to learn more about uh, the next steps we should be taking here. So that is us. Terrific. I'll go ahead and hop in here. My name is Mike Aguilar, also known as Moog. I am the director of esports and co-curricular innovation for the University of Oklahoma and have been developing at OU now for five years inside of now the Division of Student Affairs um, with one of the largest communities on campus, um, tons of representation from any discernible demographic and scholarship and academic curriculum now spawning as well. Excellent, thank you so much for being here. Okay, well, if anybody else wants to chime in, you can use the chat function to do that. It, it starts to, uh, but it's just wonderful to hear all the different approaches, all the different spots that people are in. Um, let's, and I'm going to invite uh, uh, Ryan, you want to go first, and, and we'll introduce ourselves real briefly, and then we'll launch into the content. That's where we'll spend the balance of our time today, and, and our content will be very interactive, so please, if you have questions, feel free to unmute, pop them into chat. Um, we see ourselves as facilitating a conversation, not owning it. So, you know, it's us together, all of us. Ryan, yeah. go ahead. My name's Ryan. Um, I'm one of the co-authors on the book. 
I really put in my perspective as being a student while also participating competitively in esports while going through law school. Um, met George while presenting on esports and higher education at the National Conference on Law and Higher Education. Uh, when was that, George? 2019? 2018? That was a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'm excited to continue to be able to present this information to administrators and stuff like that to get esports programs onto college campuses. Thanks, Ryan. Charles? So, uh, Charlie Huber, I am the, currently the Dean of Students at Schreiner University, a small private liberal arts school in uh, Kerrville, Texas just right in the middle of Texas. And I've uh, been working in higher ed now for just over 20 years uh, in a variety of roles through student activities and uh, now as the Dean of Students. And my interest in esports came about one, I was a, a sort of a gamer back when the gaming was not as popular as it is now. And then uh, we launched esports at, on our campus and I've also facilitated the uh, creation of a Division Three conference tournament and tournament schedule. And so we, through, with our NCAA conference, uh, we have a separate organization and organizational structure within that conference that we've created. Uh, and we have a big tournament every year for that. And so launching that program on our campus and then working with schools to help launch programs on their campuses. And so I have a, a little company that does that, that helps schools get this started. And it's a, a, it's been a lot of fun over the past five, six years. I think I met George much the same way Ryan did. I was at a conference and uh, I, I, we may have been talking about esports um, on the board for NASPA and uh, uh, work with that group a lot. So, um, but excited to be here today. Thank you so much. And, and I'm George McCullen and for me, esports, well, I find esports fascinating in tons of ways. Um, in my background, I was a student affairs professional for 30 something odd years, about 15 of those as a senior student affairs officer. And then about four years ago, made the transition to full-time faculty life. And um, so, so esports for me is situated at the intersection of a lot of things that I think are really fascinating. Um, issues of student success, issues of uh, enrollment management, issues of campus culture, issues of intercollegiate athletics, uh, issues of teaching and learning. I, I, for me, esports is such a rich and amazing opportunity. And I know I share this with Charles and Ryan. The reason we're all involved in this is esports is really gonna do great things in higher ed or it's gonna screw a lot of people up. <laughs> And, and we're trying to help as much as we can get folks in higher ed to get on the front end of things and help things turn out really well for students and institutions. Um, and so that's, that's what we'll spend the next hour talking about. And if you've had a chance to read the book or if you're interested in the book, uh, some of what we're talking about today is in the book, but in greater detail, some of it will be new add-on content. That's one of the fascinating things about where we are. The book came out really just a year ago, it came out right as the COVID pandemic was sort of moving into deep grass. And um, esports is the one activity on a lot of our campuses that kept going. And it's amazing how much change there's been in esports since the book came out. So today's conversation, we'll touch on some of what's in the book, but we'll also update some information. And again, we invite everybody to share. So we wanted to start out, though, talking about, and, and a number of you mentioned you're in this group, the folks who are getting programs started. What are some things that we think, and, and throughout all three segments, we're going to talk about getting programs started, and then we're going to talk about keeping them vital and keeping them healthy, and then we're going to talk about what's out there in the future that we think, think folks might want to be aware of. Those are sort of the three hunks that we plan to cover in the conversation. And throughout, we'll be talking about what should institutions be thinking about and what might student athletes be thinking about. And so we want to start with, don't make me sing, you know, from the sound of music, because I will, and we'll all be very sorry. Um, we're going to start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Um, so uh, Charles, why don't you talk about if, if 
institutions are thinking about getting started with programs, what needs to be in mind? Well, you know, one of the things, the first question anybody should ask is why? Why, why would you start a program and what benefits do you see? I think we often in education and in, in all things, and I think I read this in Learning Reconsidered, uh, we, we throw darts at a wall and then we paint the target around the darts and pat ourselves on the back. Uh, you need to be strategic. Why are you starting a program? For a small liberal arts school, for us, it was an enrollment driver. We wanted to, uh, we are creating programs uh, that would attract students to come to our school that wouldn't otherwise come. It was also a retention issue. So if we get students involved, we know that they'll, uh, they're will they more likely to stay. So we're looking at this on both sides. Um, so that was our purpose, but we're also budget driven and, and enrollment for us at a small private school is very important in that driver. So we had to look at a, a return on investment. What does it cost to bring a student what does it cost to, to maintain a team? So that we had to ask those questions. And we wrestled with that when we add programs, any programs, athletics reports to me. So if, if we're looking at adding uh, an NCAA sport, it's very similar in this why. So the first question anybody should ask is, is really is, it, is why? I, pro, I tell people all the time in my, in, when I talk to schools and, and work with them, if you don't have an esports, I think, uh, was it Big Bend? <laughs> One of you, you guys were starting a couple of y'all Big Ben and, and those places. I love to tell schools, hey, look, you, uh, you think you're going to start an esports program. The truth is you probably already have one. You're just not involved. And, and so because you've got gamers on your campus that are probably competing underneath the university's name in collegiate star league or one of these other leagues and they've you know four four or five people in their uh you know residence halls are getting together and they're competing as university students under the university's name without the university's knowledge and so i think so you ask those questions and as you build programs the second step would be to take an inventory as to, to what's going on on your campus now and that's a more nuanced and difficult thing to do but there's a lot that can happen there within that area. And so first and foremost, why are we, why are we doing this? What are we currently doing? And, and how is that working? You know, and then there's, there's a lot more detailed questions that can come in after that, but that's the first big step. Um, as groups get started, Charles, as institutions think about it, are there things they should be careful in particular not to do? Are there, um, are there common missteps? Yeah, one of the common missteps, and, and this isn't a bad thing, it does slow your process down. When the university takes too much control and direction of the program, students need to own this. So there's a, a, a gaming culture, you know, on our campus, we had a lot of students that were gamers. Uh, we, you know, and and they do their thing and they they enjoy. It. But it's really a subculture that that is sort of intentionally not mainstream. And if the university comes in or and or college or, or whatever and starts telling the students, "Here's how we think you should do what you do," they're going to continue to do it on their own. And there needs to be a benefit. So I think the, the first big hurdle that you would come, or, you know, that you would need to sort of address is how you navigate that, that bond between the students and letting them own it and the university being a part of it and sort of supporting what they wanna do. Um, I think that's the first big one. The other big one, and I think uh, from OU, Mike from OU is on here. He had a, a, a wicked awesome background set up there, but it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. If you're already esports, if you have an esports program, I think the next big challenge, maybe a misstep, is understanding the how complex the competitive environment is. You know, it's easy if you have a basketball team. You just find other basketball teams of similar size schools and you schedule games and you belong to a conference. Well, there's, I can't even count on it. It, there was a time when there were only three really big leagues in esports. They're popping up daily. And I think that the complexity of the competitive environment is definitely a stumbling block uh, for a lot of new coaches when they enter this. You just, it's like going to Chili's. You have no idea what to eat because there's everything. Um, and so it's easier when the menu's simple. 
uh, you know, we have a restaurant here in Kerrville that I like because they only have four things on the menu. And it's very simple. I know, you know, I know what I like when you, when there's so many options, I think that you can become blinded by that. And, and that just takes some time, you know, young coaches that I, I work with in esports. I think that's one of the biggest things they struggle with is, is who do we compete against? How do we schedule that? Um, what's the consistency there? I think those are, those are all excellent points. I, I would add, um, there's, there's a, it's, it's the Goldilocks and the three bears, right? Is that the right, um, you know, it, it's not too hot and it's not too cold. I hope I would, I would encourage institutions to, to build for what could happen. Sometimes people don't anticipate how big it can be. They're not familiar enough. And so they underinvest in space or they underinvest in different aspects of their program, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we all, you, we need to phase things. You don't want to, you know, but, but as you initiate, initiate with the capacity to expand. And the other thing I will say is, and, and, and we learned this, uh, all of us have over the years in presenting about this, uh, but also in doing a little bit of research around it. Try early on to build connections between your curricular and co-curricular folks, because this isn't just going to be a co-curricular thing. And Ryan will talk about this when he talks about the student perspective in just a minute, but I think the I think the institutions that are going to be the most successful at this in the long haul, and and Mike, um, you guys have had some more time at this at OU, but but the people that are going to be more successful over the long haul are the folks that are going to build off of student interest in careers in esports, in esports management, esports design, esports marketing. Um, there, there's a whole set of that stuff out there. And so there are really important curricular and co-curricular connections. And if you start out with that set of possibilities in mind, you can get a lot healthier program. Yeah. So Roland asked a, a question in the chat. What evidence do you have of the effectiveness of esports as a recruitment and retention tool? And how are you measuring that? So the evidence we have in that I'm working, I'm actually working on a, a, a paper right now for another group um, and looking at, you know, how does this impact recruitment? How does this impact retention? For us, it's easy. We measure this with all of our programs. Again, athletics reports to me. So my basketball coach has a recruitment goal every year. Here's how many, we set that at the beginning of the year. He knows how many players are graduating. He knows how many roster spots he has. And we set a goal and he has to hit that goal. The, the idea is he won't be successful as a program or as a recruiter if he takes from the pool of students that currently exist. So for esports to work towards the ROI from our, and this is a return on investment, in order for it to work on that end, he has to, our esports coach has to recruit students who aren't currently students. Now that doesn't mean that current students can't join the team when they're here, but this has to be someone who wouldn't otherwise come here. So we do measure that. And we have a very specific way that we tag students that are being recruited by the coach in our recruitment management system. And so we have, so our, all of our coaches who have recruiting responsibilities are connected to admissions. In addition to that, we measure the retention rate of all of our programs on an annual basis and we can see the trends. So uh, I tell every coach we hire, including our esports coach, there's four goals for you in your program recruit and retain, <laughs> be competitive, uh, uh, connect to the community. Oh, yeah, no, recruit and retain are two goals. <laughs> be competitive and connect to the community. So community service. It's great. Our esports team every morning when they get out here, I, I sit outside my office. There's a loop. It's a one mile loop. And we've got our esports players running the loop every morning, which is great. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that that's a part of our program is a, a fitness and wellness component, but um, a sort of uh, my attention deficit got me there for a minute, but yeah, that's how we measure it at our school. And that's another, and Roland, thank you. That's a great question. That's another, and I want to get to Ryan so we can talk about what students look for, but I, I do want to just sort of briefly highlight um, as you get started, understand, and Ryan will talk, 
often talks about this um, stereotype about esports athletes. Esports is a very physical competition. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of movement. And you need to think about the health and welfare of your student athletes. And that needs to be a part of your consideration. Ryan, so you're a student athlete and you're looking at a, a startup program at an institution, or you're thinking about which institution do you want to go to? What, what goes through your mind as a student athlete when you're looking at a startup or when you're thinking about which program should I choose to join? Right. And I think that's a perfect segue from Roland's question as well. One question that I tell the programs that I consult with to ask students that they're thinking about recruiting is just ask them if they've ever heard of your university before or your college and if they were ever planning on attending. It's a very easy box to check on, you know, was this person planning to attend before? Did they attend now? And if they and if you're getting new students. And I think that's also a question that students like to hear as well. Um, if you're recruiting new esports players, a lot of these players that are in high school right now, or maybe of college age, they don't realize how prominent esports programs are in the higher education world these days. So they want to hear like, you know, have you heard of our school? Have you heard of our esports program? You know, we offer this game that we see you play local tournaments for, you're competitive for, would you be interested in possibly coming to play for our school under a partial or full scholarship? Um, and it makes those students feel wanted. I can guarantee that you'll be at the top of their shortlist if you're the first school that has talked to them. Um, not a lot of schools do recruitment um, very well, in my opinion. I've looked into a lot of schools rec recruitment processes they are kind of haphazard and what it looks like and a mistake that I think schools should avoid is it looks like they're taking their athletic way of recruiting and trying to just copy and paste it onto their uh, esports way of recruiting which isn't going to work nearly as well uh, students are going to feel um, almost kind of blown off by the school uh, in that sense of recruiting and you're also going to miss a lot of really good talent if you recruit in that same way. But some other things that students are going to look for in your program, uh, one is the time commitment. Uh, a lot of these pro players that are of high school and college age are already spending eight to 10 hours a day playing the game, usually four to five hours with a small break in between and another four to five hours. And that is pro level time commitment. Those are the people that are probably not going to come to college. If you're looking at the top, you know, 100 players in the country, it's going to be very hard to convince them to come to a university when they're already competing at the pro level. People that are wanting to compete in college and that can also still remain competitive are going to be looking at more of a couple hour time commitment during the day. They're not going to be looking to spend their entire day playing the game, but also at the same time, they know they have to focus on uh, academics as well. They also want to have a social life and maybe be involved in other spots on campus. So that's something to think about. It's not the biggest thing that students are worried about, but moving forward, the things that they are going to be worried about are the quality of the staff and the equipment. Uh, those are the two biggest complaints that I hear from people involved in esports programs as students. And one thing that I would be very worried about, if I have a coach or a director that has no idea what they're talking about for esports, I uh, something that by the time I was my college age, I had been involved with for three to four years already. I'm not going to want to be involved in the program. I'm going to feel hindered. I'm going to feel like the staff is more of an obstacle rather than uh, support. And it's not going to make me want to participate. And Charles mentioned that there are already groups on your campuses. If you don't have an esports program that are probably playing under your school's name. Uh, I know we did in college. Uh, I had fraternity brothers and non-fraternity brothers that were playing games online. And if it was all of our fraternity, we would actually label ourselves as the fraternity as well. But if we had other people outside of the fraternity, we, we labeled ourselves as the college team, just because that we, it was something that we all had in common. We were already all in one spot on campus. We could get together in one spot and have a good time. And uh, I mean, we personally never poorly represented our school, so it wasn't an issue. But that's something that you have to think about as well. If you already have these groups participating under your name, 
how are they representing your school? And that's something that if you do create a program, you can have a little bit more watchful eye over, but you have to be careful about what Charles said again about hindering the students too much. Next is the equipment. A lot of schools uh, jump at the first deal that they're offered for a partnership deal on equipment. Uh, two places I've consulted with have done this a little quickly and the equipment's not terrible, but it's really not great. You, you, whenever you're playing a game, depending on if you're playing on a computer or a console or whatever the main platform is for the competitive level, there's a certain minimum bar of equipment that a player really needs to have to be the most competitive. Um, you know, I still see schools just getting a, an HD monitor with 60 Hertz. Now that sounds good. It's still actually really good technology. It's more than anyone that's not gaming would ever need. But if you're a gamer, you're going to be looking for possibly up to 4K resolution on your monitor and at least 144 Hertz. And now they make monitors that go up to above 210 Hertz. And these are terms that your gamers are going to throw around and that your staff needs to know the answers to whenever they ask, oh, you know, what kind of monitor do you have? Do you know if it's 144 hertz? And if you can't answer those questions, they're not going to take your program seriously. Uh, also, your peripherals, you know, uh, you can't just go buy a $20 wire wireless Logitech USB mouse from Walmart, uh, throw it in a computer and call it a day for your esports team. Uh, and people don't realize how expensive this equipment gets. Uh, it's been misbudgeted before. Uh, it's usually not too out of budget, um, but you have to realize that a $20 mouse and a $20 keyboard really is not going to cut it. Uh, that's if you're buying separately. It usually comes out to affordable whenever you're buying in bulk, but it's definitely something to think about. Uh, the last two things that you want to think about when you're starting your program that's going to affect your students is what games you're offering and if you're going to pay your players. Now, as far as games offered, um, the most important thing that I tell administrators is make sure the games fit your mission statement. Uh, there are games where the objective of, of the game is to shoot and kill another player. Uh, there, may be, there may be blood and gore involved in some sorts. And if that goes against your mission statement of your school, then don't offer the game. There's no point in forcing your school to offer a game that you disagree with because it's going to create resentment between the staff and the players. So you don't want that. And although it may be one of the most popular games, it, it's just not worth it for the issues that I've seen caused on campus. But there are some, you know, that uh, are a little bit less violent and maybe a little bit less popular and you can replace that spot that that other game would have taken up with another game you do have to realize that you may not be able to recruit as many players uh for a less popular game but at the same time uh that mission statement is going to be important and lastly is player payment player payment is the most difficult thing to handle in my opinion currently for higher education ran esports programs <clears throat> uh there is currently nothing really saying that you cannot pay your esports players uh they do uh likely fall under the same rule of uh, if you guys are sports law fans being able to receive full ride scholarships textbooks boarding housing food and everything like that and um you can all they can also walk away with their prize money if you let them it's very tough to decide what you're going to do with that because if you let the esports players walk away with their full intended prize money but you have a sports athletic team that is also winning competitions but they are not able to see a dime of it just due to ncaa sports laws or whatever um, conference you may be a part of you know it's it's hard to hard to give one set of players money for their competition and not another set. But it's also going to be tough when it, if you decide to not give them any of the money that they win, especially because esports players know that they're allowed to be play, paid for their play. And 
if you take if you don't give them any money that could create resentment between the player and the administration they could leave the program if they realize they're good enough to get paid they may just leave school entirely and enter the pro scene because these pros and esports is not like traditional athletic sports they're not 22 to 29 years old at their prime they're 16 to 23 years old at their prime so that's why a lot of these players miss out on the school and education and if they are good enough to go pro they will leave school and um, we're going to hold off on yeah on compensation We'll, we'll cover that in what's coming up because there's actually some interesting stuff out there now that that dovetails to the name image and likeness stuff that's coming out of the NCAA. So I'm gonna, right. I'm gonna say, let's hold on that. Roland, I see your question about um, a, a list of required equipment and minimum specs. Ryan, if maybe you could use the chat function to type some suggestions that would be helpful, keeping in mind that all of this stuff changes all the time, but, but Ryan might be able to pop some advice out there in the chat function, Ryan, if you don't mind. Yeah, not at all. Um, and I, I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate the point that Ryan made and, and Charles uh, talked about it earlier. We in higher ed tend to try to rebuild what we already know. And esports isn't what we already know. So there may be some things we can do that look like some things we've already seen. But it would be a mistake to just assume that we can translate those things across. And so if, if, if there are places where esports might look like other stuff, and there are places where esports is very, very different. A minor example. Folks in a conference or in an association can decide to change where the three point line is on a basketball court. You can't decide to change a feature of a particular game. It's intellectual property. It belongs to whoever holds its, its title. And as Ryan said, so you, know, you can't just say, well, we're gonna somehow get past the misogyny of this game by tweaking it. No, you won't, it belongs to somebody so you need to not go there. Um, so there are some ways that it that that esports is different, and that's a really important thing to understand. So we've talked a little bit about if you're getting started with a program. Before we go into how do you how do you patch a program, how do you maintain a program, I just want to take a, a breath and ask: Does anybody out there uh, have thoughts, things that they would add, advice that you have seen? Uh, I'm particularly thinking of Jimmy and Mike, any of the rest of you who've had a program up for a little while. Um, anything that, you know, I'll brag about the Ole Miss uh, eSports program. I know we're, we're a really nice quality program. Um, anybody else have advice, things that you think we ought to cover here before we move into, for the startup folks? I'll chime, I'll chime in here a little bit. Um, I really want anyone that's now approaching this topic from a day one energy of how do I get started into taking what has already been discussed and one step further about the cultures on your campus and the academic opportunities they present as uh, one of the words that gets thrown or phrases that gets thrown around a lot, um, especially from the student side is path to pro. So the idea that that traditional athletic pipeline of getting recruited into a university and then getting drafted into the pros has some kind of place here and it's very rare. I think there's less than 10 cases across the entire North American continent where that has happened um, well documented. However, what higher education does represent an opportunity in esports uh, with this topic is, is a path to industry. So with path to industry, if we talk about what an esports event looks like, you have production, which is typically in a journalism college or communications college, you have sponsorship deals and, and venue operations, which also deals with international business and compliance which then call your colleges of business. You have research opportunities in sciences like psychology, anthropology, sociology. 
that will also spawn other ideas of how to innovate with this topic. And it does get a little broad really quickly, but these are also other ways of supporting the infrastructure needs of a program. Because even if you're fielding teams to compete on an inter intercollegiate level, well, that's an opportunity to research how that neuroscience is used, how that psychology is used, which is still part of the reason that we're in higher education as well is to help establish these new ideals and document them well. So there's a lot more at the table than often um, approaching this topic purely about the student engagement piece exclusively for the recruitment pipeline in that regard. This can also be a, a way to, to invigorate um, the academic mission of the university just as much as the engagement and student affairs uh, recruitment energies. Yeah, no, Mike, I'm so glad. I mean, and I had just, I had tried to briefly touch on that earlier, but thank you. That, that was a, a very thoughtful and thorough discussion. There are so many opportunities here to do what we always talk about. Let's link the curricular and the co-curricular. Let's have them actually complement and extend and support one another. Anybody else? Uh, I could throw in a little bit here, George. Uh -huh. um, so one of the things that we do at Ole Miss to uh, keep as many people involved as possible is that we actually have both the club and a varsity side of things. Um, and I use the word varsity uh, loosely here because we're not part of athletics on campus. We're actually part of ac academics. Um, but we have, the, we have the teams that we officially sponsor. And then we have the club, which we partially sponsor. So they get to use our equipment. Uh, we host events for them. But then on the other side of that, they also help the varsity side. Uh, a lot of times these, these students come in and they will do casting on the games. Um, when we're streaming, they'll be the ones talking while our while our players are actually playing during a game at night. Um, and then uh, to tie into what you and and Mike said, we also work directly with other organizations, other schools, um, and departments on campus. We work directly with the Department of Journalism, uh, and those students learn, come in, and they do they do sports uh, esports casting. Uh, we work with. Uh, the um, physical sciences like uh, Dr. Andre on campus who has written, I think now three papers on, on the uh, kinesiology um, of esports, And um, like he's hooked our players up to blood pressure monitors while they play uh, to, and things such as that. And you mentioned earlier that there's a, there's most people think of gamers, you know, big guys sitting in their basements um, <laughs> eating Cheetos and, and playing video games, uh, but when when we monitor our players, uh, like our Call of Duty players, uh, their their heart rate gets up to like 220 beats per minute, which is just an insane level. I mean, you're talking about uh, you're talking about professional athletes yeah. with heart rates there. So um, uh, athletic trainers, scientists, uh, journalism, uh, computer science, all of these all of these curricula tie in together. Um, and I think you need all of those people working together to make the program um, successful. Excellent point, Jimmy. Thank you. Ryan is sad because he does have Cheetos, but he doesn't have a basement. And this just is no end of frustration to him. Um, you know, George, I'll jump in real quick. I, I like the idea that, and I, I tell schools this, and, and we do this too, is to have that competitive and that recreational program. Again, as a student affairs professional, my goal is to get as many people involved as possible. And we want, if you want to play games on campus, we're going to find a spot for you. And we, and we do the same thing. The other piece as we just, as you design a program is to not put all your eggs in one basket. This landscape is going to change. It's going to change rapidly. A game that is popular now may not be popular a year from now or two years from now. And so um, I, I, you know, I, I talk about it in it, like building a track program. You're not just going to have hundred meter dash. You're not just going to have long jump. You're going to have multiple events. And this is the complexity in hiring a coach as Ryan sort of pointed out is you want somebody who's, who's a gamer and, and understands the, and gets the equipment and understands all of those nuances, but you're probably not going to find somebody that can do all the games and that's super proficient in all the games. And yeah, so and a, uh, a the hiring place. of a coach and then the design of your program overall. This is a great place important. to think about going with student assistant coaches so that you can get support around particular games. I'm, we got to move on to patching a program. I'll just say, if you look in the book, 
we talk about three levels of co-curricular program. We talk about recognized student organizations, club sports, and varsity sports. And that can be a helpful framework for thinking about that question. All right, patching a program. You're up, you're running, and now you got to keep it sustained. You don't want to be last year's, you know, flash in the pan. You want to keep this going. How do you keep a program vital? What's, um, Kim says, what's the title of the book? Uh, it's esports in, <laughs> you think I would know. It's esports and higher education supporting student athletes and something, supporting the success of student athletes and programs or something. Stylus, forgive me, I just mangled the title. Charles, Ryan? Yeah, oh, I'm pretty sure I typed it right. Yeah, it's yeah. in the oh, chat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stylus, okay. Stylus was nice enough to put the link in there. We're not the best salesman of the book. We're sorry, Stylus. We, we beg your forgiveness. Um, the um, Let's talk about patching the program. So um, I see Ryan's working still on his, in his uh, peripheral stuff. So uh, Ryan, do you want me to start with Charles? We can start with myself or Charles. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yep. So let's talk about Ryan from a student perspective. You joined a program. How do we keep it vital? What keeps you engaged as a student athlete player? What keeps you coming back? Well, one thing we keep coming back to is you have to let the students at least have a say in where this program goes. They don't have to be the sole voice of where the program goes because you you know, the students do have the gaming experience, but the administrative staff has the administrative experience and students will recognize that, but you can't let that administrative experience come in and overshadow that gaming experience that they have. If a new league pops up that they want to join and the whole team is on board, but the staff is like, ah, oh, we've never heard of this league. Maybe we stay away from it. The, as long as there's no real negative in joining the league, just join the league. Uh, if there's no registration fee, if they're going to be playing against other teams at a competitive level, whether they're schools or not, uh, as long as it doesn't take away from the main goal of your program, you let them let them shepherd you into the new stuff. Because th what's going to happen when a new thing pops up is by the time you have first heard about it, they've already put 20 hours of research into it. And that's just the that's just the way it goes. It's the same way. You know, if new football leagues were popping up, football players would know about it before their uh, before their directors would, and they'd be like, "Oh, this is a cool new football league that I just found in my area. Let's take a look at it." But that obviously doesn't happen in traditional sports. So you gotta let the gotta let the players kind of take the reins here. Um, and in, it's still a community driven model. There is no right way to run an esports program yet. There are very, very visible uh, points in traditional athletics where if you're doing this, you're doing it right. If you're doing this, you're doing it wrong. There's nothing really like that for esports. Uh, there's obviously very clear ones. You know, you don't want to let uh, any sort of harassment or bullying be happening in your program and stuff like that. The very, very obvious ones. But in the middle, there's there's not a lot of right and wrong viewpoints that you can just look at and be like they're running their program correctly uh a lot of people are gauging that based off recruitment and retention right now or whether they're competitive but they don't a lot of people i feel like fail to realize too how involved their current community is getting in uh everyone's really focused about bringing in people that would have not come into their school to begin with which is great uh but sometimes it does cause schools to overlook how involved their current uh student base is getting involved and lastly, uh, something that one of you touched on is you've got to supplement your program with other opportunities for the students. Uh, one thing that I talk to, to schools a lot about whenever um, I'm consulting for them is academic opportunities. Uh, Esports management is becoming a very big elective class in a lot of schools. Uh, there's not a baseline certification for it yet, but if you talk to two or three people, you'll, you'll get the basics of um, managing a program, uh, branding, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then as far as other opportunities go, you talk about broadcasting, you got IT possibilities. Uh, you know, if a student's interested in IT, 
they can work around your stadium. They're the ones that are uh, checking the computers, making sure everything's updated, making sure everything's good to go. Student assisted coaching, you know, maybe you've got uh, uh, your coach that you've hired who's really, really good at League of Legends, but he's not super good at Call of Duty. And so you let one of the students really take over the coaching role of the Call of Duty uh, team because he's just better than the coaches. And most coaches don't have too much of an ego or arrogance about them that they'll really want to maintain power there. A lot of people involved in the esports community uh, take pride that they're only really good at one or two games because it takes a lot of time to get good at those games and they don't mind giving a little bit of control away to another student that may have a little bit more insider skill. Thank you, Ryan, very much. Um, Charles, you see that question from Greg there? Um, what it, and, and I realize, and Greg does too, there are a lot of variables. It sort of depends on how you're gonna build it up, but um, maybe Charles, you can share just a, a swag number in chat or something. The, um, yeah. I, I wanna add before we, I'm gonna give Charles a chance to come up with a swag answer. And, but I will add, uh, and I know Ryan cares a lot about this. We've talked often about it. Um, it. You know, like a lot of things, there are great things about esports and there are challenging things about esports. And one of the challenging things about esports can be the culture of the game and the competition. Um, there can be uh, misogyny and there can be uh, heterosexism and there can be racism and there can be uh, nationalism and and there they're just all there can be a lot of isms uh, and so I think one of the keys to keeping a program healthy we've talked about the health of the athletes we've talked about keeping the games going we've talked about making connections to the curricular content we've talked about um, you know, building both vertically and horizontally in terms of the scope of the offerings that you have. But attention must, must be paid to the culture of your team and to the environment that you build around that team. If you want your esports program to be a positive, both experience, but not only a positive experience for the students in the program, but also a positive thing on your campus in terms of your campus environment. Esports can either be a giant center of sucking dysfunction or, or it can be a really cool positive environment. And how that goes is not an accident. How that goes is purpose. And you have to start out to build it and you have to work to keep. Uh, so I just wanted to I just wanted to put that in. Uh, Charles, you ready to take on how to keep the program running? Yeah, really quickly. And and the only thing that I would add, you know, beyond what Ryan and and George have just talked about, is one of the as we work with schools, it seems like oh we can start a program uh, on this shoestring budget. We'll buy some old computers. And we're going to throw them in an old computer lab and they never need to leave campus because, you know, that's the whole benefit is we can have an esports team and we lock them up on that side of campus and treat them like stepchildren. And uh, we don't even need to hire a coach. They just coach themselves. That's not going to work. Um, and, it, you know, if it if it if all you're doing is again, I, I go back to when you design the program, what's the purpose? If all you're doing is checking a box saying, hey, we offer esports. Well, you know, that, that's what you would do. In my opinion, in order to keep a program going, you have to continuously treat it at least as well as you do other programs. Students are going to feel as valued as, as, as you want them to feel. And if you, for instance, I build in travel. <laughs> We're going to take our students at least somewhere. And it's going to be a convention, a conference tournament, you know, whatever it is. There's PAX South for us nearby, and they have esports uh, uh, sections to that, but th these students sh should just like the basketball team gets to go places or the football team or our debate team or, or theater group, whatever they get to go and do things that needs to be built into this as well. And I think that's a, that's a model. 
even if, uh, you know, what, if there was an international trip every year that the esports team raised funds for, those are the things that are going to keep students wanting to come back and keep them engaged. It's th these are the small things, but it's also you have to invest, you know, are your jerseys really nice? Uh, the, the difference between being a part of a school program and just doing it on your own is that the school can uh, supplement some of these costs so students aren't out of pocket on this. Oftentimes, a lot of our gamers, they would rather use their own equipment because they're used to it and they feel like they keep it better up to date than the school. And this is where we need help, too. That's another sustainability issue is making sure your equipment stays up to date. You know, computers uh, get old and they use them fast. We have a cleaning process once a week. Uh, when you use the computers and the, the consoles and all that as much as we do, the students go in every week and they, you know, air out the keyboards and, and wipe down everything. And, and that was before COVID. When we added, when COVID came, we added extra uh, layers of cleaning for uh, health and safety reasons. But we still did that because we want to maintain the equipment. So as you do this program, have a schedule, treat it like a regular, treat it like the other programs in the sense that you give it the attention. Now, every program has is unique and you design the program that you want at your school. So figure out what you want and then and give it the attention. Don't don't let it just kind of, oh, well, we we got this money at the beginning. We launched the program. Now they're on their own forever. And, and we're just going to leave them alone because we've checked the box. Uh, you wouldn't do that to your other programs. If I can, let me follow up on that. A couple of things. One, um, there are wonderful opportunities to do fundraising and friend making around esports. Um, there are marketing opportunities to be had, partnerships to be struck there. There are equipment deals to be made. Um, and um, think you know, you, you, you know, there are naming opportunities. You can have the game room named. You can, have, if you're going to build an esports arena or convert an esports arena, um, you know, these are all naming opportunities. So part of maintaining a program is helping it to become more physically sustainable. Um, the other thing that I'll say about a program is and associations are changing. But at the moment, um, I think this week its name is still NACE. Although people change names all the time. So NACE, N-A-C-E, the National Association of Collegiate Esports, right? Mm -hmm. um, it started out uh, it wasn't going to be an association. It, it was just a collection of people promoting esports and higher education. It has now become its own uh, independent not-for-profit. They have a constitution and a set of bylaws. Um, NACE offers a lot of wonderful opportunities, and I think all of us would support institutions taking a good look at NACE as a possibility. The one thing that we all agree on, the three of us, when it comes to any association is they are membership associations. Um, they're only as good as the members make them. So, you know, it's like the NCAA. I'm always fascinated when people want to sort of finger wag the NCAA as if it's a them. But the NCAA is us, the member institutions. And that's how NACE is too. So if we sit back and we're passive, esports will evolve or devolve in its own way. We have to own it as higher ed if we want it to get to where we want it to get to. The other group that um, we'll point out to you, and I have to read its name because it changes all the time, the Esports Integrity Coalition. Um, and again, if you look in the back of the book, there are websites for all of this stuff. The Esports Integrity Coalition is involved in promoting ethics in esports. And there are a lot of issues around esports um, associated with gaming and gambling institutions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> Jimmy's exactly right about locker rooms and esports labs. Um, so we also would encourage you to take a look at the, at the Esports Integrity Group. Um, we think they have something to offer.
So that's a little bit about keeping a program up and running. We're, we're up against time and we get pretty excited about this stuff. We can talk a lot about it. Uh, before we're gonna, we're gonna shift to what's on the horizon. We don't have much time, but anybody online wanna share other tips for keeping a program vital? Anybody have other tips on how do you keep a program going? I will add only one thing and it ties into what I said earlier about having the, the club slash social side along with the, with the varsity side. And that is that our club actually has an executive council that gets elected by the students every year. And we let that executive council have a say so in the direction that our varsity team is going. Great idea. Uh, you've, you've heard us say it, oh, and Jimmy said it again. You've heard us say it over and over and over again. There is a culture in esports. Institutions, esports student athletes will never see institutions as owning esports. They don't see the gaming companies owning esports. They believe the players own esports. <laughs> and if you don't respect that and understand it, you're headed for trouble. Um, okay, just briefly, I, we're talking about what's on the horizon, and we've we've mentioned things. We've mentioned the ways that esports are different than other stuff, and in the book, we talk about something we call structuration. As esports got started, one of the challenges, and Charles talked about it, finding leagues, finding competitors, all that kind of stuff. As esports has grown, and just look at the people on this call. Leagues have propped up, groups have popped up, competitions have popped up. And in some ways that's good. There, there are more structures out there than there were before, although you still may have to do some creating on your own. But that means you need to be really careful in thinking about who you line yourself up with and why. Um, the other thing that's going on is when esports started, and Ryan talked about this, I, I used to say esports was like bass fishing or rodeo when it comes to college athletics. And I don't know how many of you have a bass fishing club or a rodeo team, but there are examples of sports in which student athletes could actually earn cash prizes, and they could they could compete as pros at the same time that they were competing as student athletes. And that was really, really different when esports started. But with the movement in NIL issues, name, image, and likeness issues in the NCAA, that's starting to come together more now. And there may be some things I just saw, I think it was North Carolina, somebody can check me if I'm wrong. But one of the questions that we used to talk about was, okay, so you have an esport athlete. And they have a deal, well, I'll just use Ryan. So Ryan is Croctopus. And so let's say Ryan is marketing Croctopus. And let's say he's playing for the University of Mississippi. And the University of Mississippi has a property interest in that brand. So if Ryan's making money off of being Croctopus at Ole Miss, you know, I'm from Chicago, where's ours? Where's a little something for us, a little taste, right? And so um, I just saw that, I think it was North Carolina is the first like big time athletics institution that's actually inked a deal with its athletes that allows for, for this kind of revenue sharing and co-branding. I think there's gonna be more of that moving forward. And for those of you who are recruiting student athletes who come in, with sponsorships, with branding, with, with who are making money off of Twitch and casting and all of that kind of stuff, there may start to be more examples now of how do you co-brand than there were in the beginning. It's something that's worth keeping an eye on. That's, that's one thing that's coming down the road. Uh, quickly, Charles and Ryan, anything else? Coming yeah. Down the road? I would I would just want to issue a warning with that uh co-branding talk that we just had. Don't try to ink a deal if you haven't actually helped the the student do anything to get to where they are. Uh, that's the quickest. That's normally not an issue with schools that I see, but it is an issue more with esports companies. They will recognize the success of a player 
and then just try to take from that success without supporting that success. If you're going to want to get in on the revenue that that player is generating, you have to support them in some way, you know, whether it's with uh, equipment to improve the quality of their play or uh, equipment to improve the quality of their streams, or maybe you have a graphic designer make images for them. You have to find some way to support them or else that player is eventually going to realize that it feels like you're just taking money from them for free and it is going to blow up in the esports scene. The people really do not like that. You will have a black mark next to your name and it will take a very long time for it to fade. Excellent advice. Charles. I would I would be really so um I'm going to go back in time a few years when I had a bass fishing team at another school that I was working at and the state and this was a public school. And so the rules are different. So when you and for the state of Texas and every state may be different. So I would be really careful about, you know, how you pay students and, and where the money goes. So our bass fishing team entered a tournament. The school paid for the registration for the tournament. So it was with school money, which with the state of Texas, when you're a public school, that's state money. So state money paid for the entry. The students won the tournament. They won twenty five thousand dollars and a boat. So the state of Texas says we paid for the entry regardless of who did it. It's ours. And so uh, you went under our banner. The state of Texas owns that boat and owns that money. And so there are complications to this. It's different if a, if a player is going out on their own. Like if one of those guys had gone out and paid for their own registration, entered the tournament and wore a, a, a jersey from the school and, and won the tournament, you know, oh, well, you know, they used our likeness. That to me, that's an easier, easier fix. It's thinking about what happens when the school pays for their registration and enters them and pays for their travel. So, you know, the school gets a hotel and, and does this and does that and that the school paid for you to be there. You're representing the school. Now that's a more complicated question. And it may be easier if you're a private school because, you know, hey, we just, you uh, talk about it ahead of time. Now, I will say we've had an esports program for a while and, and we've had highly ranked athletes in, in sports. We haven't had the issue yet of where the money goes. Uh, we just, you know, I think making money is something you have to really work at. And as far as our school competitions and our school programs, those teams aren't generating revenue for us in terms right. of like uh, entries. Now, some of them are doing it on their own with their streaming channels and they've got, you know, they're, they're doing that. And we don't prohibit that. Um, but yeah, I would just be real careful uh, about that because those students on that bass fishing team were very angry that they didn't get to keep their boat. <clears throat> yes. The, um, we're, we're at the end of our hour. Thank you to everybody who came and joined us for this conversation. I know we, we lost some folks who had to jump off right at the end of the hour. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Uh, thank you to Stylus for, for bringing us together. This is a topic we could just talk and talk and talk and talk about. It is so fascinating. Um, again, we encourage you to take a look at the book. I will say on behalf of Ryan and Charles, uh, thank you all and turn this back to our friends at Stylus for closing. Thank you to George, Ryan, and Charles for sharing their time and presenting with us today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in live with us this afternoon on Zoom. If you are interested in ordering eSports in higher education, use code eSport, E-S-P-O-R-T, to get 20% off the book and free shipping from Stylus Publishing. I will share that and the uh, book uh, link in the sidebar. The webinar video replay will be available on Friday and shared on all of our Stylus social media feeds and our Stylus YouTube channel. The webinar chat log will also be saved and emailed to everyone who has registered as well. If you have any feedback on this webinar or any requests for future webinars, please feel free to email us directly at stylusinfo at styluspub.com. <laughs>